And in the map, you can see our North Bullion, Pod, Dark Star, Pinion, and Jasperoid wash deposits. For the majority of this talk, our Pod and North Bullion deposits will be kind of one and the same. Here we look at a more in-depth view of our property. You can see uh, the immigrant mine to the northeast, which has identified 1.2 million ounces of gold at 0.62 grams of gold per ton. And to the due north, the rain mine, which identified 3.8 million ounces of gold at 10.3 grams of gold per ton. Through, through our property, we have three major fault corridors, which are key for exploration. Our Jasperoid Wash Corridor, on the west, our North Boolean, or our Boolean and Pinion corridor in the center, and our Dark Star corridor to the east. Between our property and the three uh, fault corridors, we are looking for two major stratigraphic uh, horizons for our Carlin type deposits. Our first stratigraphic horizon is our Devonian and Mississippian contact zone which is the host at our North Boolean and Pinion deposits, and our Pennsylvanian and Permian host rocks, which are hosts at Dark Star and Jasperoid Wash. These are, our structural corridors are uh, highlighted areas, which include fault and, dike, fault and dikes with underlying anticlines, which are very important. These three prospective fault corridors are the focus for our exploration for our Carlin type deposits. These are formed by multiple regional compressional events that have included multiple thrust faults and associated anticlines. Also around our the Boolean stock, we have targets for intrusion related deposits, which would contain silver, gold, copper, lead, and zinc in SCARN and replacement deposits. Here we can see a stratigraphic column of the railroad pinion district. On the left, you can see where we have our alteration and our gold mineralization, which are two main zones, which are highlighted in our dark red, are hosting gold in our dark star and Jasper wash deposits in the Pennsylvania and Permian carbonate rocks, as well as our pinion and North Boolean deposits further down stratigraphically, which are between our Mississippian Web, Tripon Pass, and Devonian Devil's Gate with a multi-lithic dissolution collapse breccia hosting some of the higher grades in the deposits. Between some of the previous companies that have controlled the land package, some of these companies have done previous geophysical campaigns. Ken Ross, has done gravity and CSAMT, or for those of you who are not familiar, controls, controlled source audio frequency magneto to lyrics. Mirandor with ground and airborne magnetics. Newmont with gravity and IP or induced polarization. Ramrod Gold with IP, ground magnetics and CSAMT and Westmont with a multispectral analysis which was done with the use of Landsat 4. We won't go into any more detail about that as it's not quite geophysics, but I thought it would be an interesting bit of uh, information to include. So the geophysical and geochemical methods that GSV has used, and we mainly stick to are soil and rock geochemistry in tandem with airborne magnetics, ground magnetics, gravity, CSAMT and 2D seismic. And we have a small collage of some of our geophysics to the left. Starting off with surface geochemistry, we have our soil samples. We have 23,400 soil samples across the property. 15,000, a little over 15,000 of those soil samples were taken by GSV and an additional 2,706 samples taken in the 2020 field season at our South Dome Prospect area in the far southwest of the property. Moving on to our rock samples, we have 13,587 samples, including historic data, with 
12,700 of those samples being taken by GSV. Almost 1,000 samples were taken in the 2020 field season across the property, with some of those being in the South Dome property or South Dome Prospect area as well. Moving on to airborne magnetics, GSV purchased a airborne magnetic survey from PRJ back in 2016, which consists of a little over 7,700 line kilometers. And that survey was done with 200 meter line spacing and one kilometer tie line spacing on a northeast southwest line orientation. This survey was done in 1997, but like I said, it was purchased in 2016. And you can see here, the red lines are the flight lines of the aircraft which did the survey. We have quite dense data acquisition over the railroad pinion project. Here we look at our, we're looking at our reduced to pole airborne magnetics data. You can see the very bright large Eocene granodiorite intrusion, also known as the Boolean stock, which forms a very large magnetic high. Around the margins of the Boolean stock and, sur and surrounding Skarn and Hornfels at the northeast corner of the intrusion. And that would be the area up in here. Paleozoic rocks are generally non-magnetic, so large areas of the property are magnetically flat, especially if you look at the dark star and pinion deposits, as well as the jasphoid wash deposit further to the south. The Eocene Indian Wells formation shows strong positive and negative magnetic response to the east of the district due to remnant magnetism. Here we have our airborne magnetics data showing our main three fault corridors. Our aerial magnetic or airborne magnetics has been useful around the stock and other intrusive centers, but fails to identify these major fault corridors. Intrusions along our known fault corridors are either non-magnetic or highly oxidized as they do not show up in this survey. Moving on to ground magnetics. GSV completed one ground magnetic survey in 2014, which consisted of 196.6 line kilometers using 100 meter line spacing. The survey was focused on the Boolean mining district to identify magnetic anomalies on a finer scale. We're gonna zoom into that now. Here, we're looking at our reduced to pole ground magnetics data. And for those of you who are familiar with the area, here are some labels. We have Pine Mountain to the west, the summit of Bunker Hill, and the old town site of Boolean. And this data has been analyzed by Jim Wright, and he has interpreted this with the Boolean stock in the center of the magnetic survey. And highlighted in red now are Jim's potential scarns, with the black lines being uh, igneous lineations or contacts. Next, we will look at Virginia Gillerman's mapping from 1982. And as you can see, the Delma Scarn shows up in both. There are several adits that are uh, punched into the Delma Scarn, including the Delmas Mine. On surface, this is a very obvious Scarn zone with lots of garnet and metasomatic alteration. We also have lots of small scarns, which are located south of the Delma Scarn here. Moving on to gravity. We have 5,202 stations, which were taken in seven different surveys between 2009 and 2017. There are 79 historical gravity stations taken by Newmont. The majority of our surveys were done with stations on a 200 meter or 400 meter grid, depending on the level of detail that we were looking for out of the survey. These surveys must be input with a known average density of the rock, whereas in the Carlin area and GSV specifically, we have chosen 2.3 and 2.55 grams per cubic centimeter for average rock density across the property. 
Here we're looking at our 2.55 residual gravity. Our gravity surveys are important to define fault corridors due to juxtaposition of higher density carbonate rocks against lower density siliciclastic and volcanic rocks. These gravity surveys also define the continuation of fault corridors beneath cover and the identification of blind targets. Next, we'll be zooming into this area highlighted in red. Here, we can see the shaded regions, which are our pinion deposit and our dark star deposit. Our gravity surveys in this area have proven effective in identifying alteration and assist with vectoring into gold mineralization. Some of those alterations that we look for are decalcification and silicification, which you can see here, highlighted by the red oval. This embayment of the high, higher gravity signal is due to the decalcification and silicification, which is less dense than the uh, carbonate host rocks. Our gravity also identifies major fault corridors, but can also identify intermediate structures that offset carbonate stratigraphy, such as our Boolean fault, which is a major fault, but we can identify our dark star fault, our saddle fault, and our west fault. While the gravity does not show the dark star fault or the west fault extremely well, what it does show is the offset of our saddle fault further to the northwest. The identification of these intermediate structures and offsets is crucial in vectoring in towards gold mineralization. Moving on to CSAMT. GSV completed eight surveys across the property uh, consisting of 185 line kilometers. With each survey, our electric field receiver dipoles were spaced at 50 meters. We have one historic Kinrom survey in the northern part of the railroad property. As you can see in the image, all of these red lines are our previous CSAMT lines. Here, we're looking at a CSAMT depth slice between 50 and 100 meters. CSAMT is very good at defining individual fault strands within fault corridors. CSAMT is a highly effective where higher resistivity Paleozoic carbonate rocks are in fault contact with lower resistivity tertiary volcanic rocks. Zooming into our dark star deposit, we're currently looking at a high definition orthophoto, which was flown in late 2020. You can see all of our disturbance indicating drill pads and drill roads with our north dark star deposit uh, deposit and main dark star deposit further to the south. Here we have our outcrop mapping and interpretive geologic mapping done by Steve Moore in 2015. Identified in the blue and yellow lithologies, we can see the horse of Pennsylvanian and Permian rocks, which would be our Moline and Tamara formations, which are exposed at surface. Here we have our North Dark Star and Main Dark Star grade thickness contours. As you can see, Main Dark Star has grade contours which extend far to the west. These are not at surface, but are actually subterranean dipping to the west. These lines are the four main CSAMT lines that cross the Dark Star deposit. And we'll be looking in particular at the furthest north highlighted in green. Here we have our CSAMT cross section. You can see the cooler colors indicate higher resist electrical resistivity, noting the purple, which is directly over the grade thickness contours. Next, we'll look at Jim Wright, our contract geophysicist, um, interpretation of this cross section. Here you can see the two main arrows coming up as potential feeder structures that are identified, bounded by the West Fault and the Dark Star Fault. 
here we're looking at the same orthophoto and a CSAMT depth slice of zero to 50 meters of depth. The contours help highlight areas of high electrical resistivity and then adding on our grade thickness contours, you can see that what is at surface and within the zero to 50 meter depths is highly indicative of where our high resistivity is due to a high degree of decalcification and silicification, which is a proxy for gold mineralization at the dark star deposit. Moving on to seismic. On the left, you can see our geophones, which are an array of sensors that are put out in a line across the topography. And on the right, you can see our seismic source or thumper truck with, in the bottom right image, the foot on the ground ready to transmit its seismic signals or frequencies. GSV conducted five or two main seismic surveys, one in 2017 across the Dark Star and Pinion deposits, and one in, 28, or one in 2018 consisting of three lines over the North Boolean deposit. As you can see, due to uh, steep topography, line two of our 2017 survey had to have a slight bend in it, and line one and 11, also known as 111, of our 2018 survey actually had to be broken into two lines due to very steep topography. While they did mess with some of our data, they are not catastrophic and we did receive some good data out of these. The five lines totaled 37 line kilometers and we had three processing attempts. Two were done by Sterling and Western GECO and a third processing attempt by Satish P. We recently received our depth conversions by Satish in the last couple of weeks. So let's zoom to those. We'll be focusing on line one furthest to the south, highlighted in green. Here you can see our seismic depth conversion and where we have three major anaclines, which are highlighted in orange. We have our jasperoid wash anacline, our pinion boolean anacline, and our dark star anacline which are also our structural corridors. Here, we have the cross sections of our pinion deposit and our dark star deposits highlighted in red. What the seismic survey is able to tell us is where our major faults are. And I'll bring those in here. These, our seismic survey also shows very strong seismic reflectors. One of those is directly beneath the pinion deposit and to the west, which is highlighted in green. This is our Mississippian Devonian contact. Our Mississippian rocks are mainly our Mississippian tripon pass and web formations, with the Devonian being the Devonian Devil's Gate formation. This forms a very strong seismic reflector but you can notice that our green trace ends at the Boolean fault. The seismic reflector that is very strong continuing to the east actually is not the same Mississippian Devonian contact. While we don't know why this is, we do know that over by our dark star deposit, highlighted in yellow is our Pennsylvanian and Mississippian contact. We've identified this based on drilling uh, with above the yellow lines being our Pennsylvanian and Permian rocks consisting of the Moline and Tamara formations, and below the yellow lines being our Mississippian Chainman and potentially our Mississippian Tonka formations. We do not know exactly why the seismic reflector continues over to the Pinion deposit, but likely our Mississippian Devonian contact has been down dropped quite far along our Boolean fault here. Next, we'll be focusing on the area highlighted in red around our dark star deposit. Here, you can see the zoomed in uh, seismic section of our dark star deposit, where we have some very strong seismic reflectors indicating a strong anticline. 
Here we have our cross section of our dark star deposit highlighted in red. Here we have added in our major structures, including the West Fault, the Ridgeline Fault, and the Dark Star Fault to the east. We have our seismic reflector, which is our Pennsylvanian and Mississippian contact here. As you notice below our Western Pennsylvanian and Mississippian contact, I have a dashed in potential contact. We believe that we have a thrust fault, which is duplicating our stratigraphic section here. And while the West Fault is down dropping the repeated section, it looks in cross section like it is actually uplifting this seismic reflector. We also can see that we have an over, over steepened east limb of our anticline further to the east of our reflectors. This is also indicative of a fault cord anticline. We do have some deep drilling in this area to determine what these lithologies are. In 2019, we drilled our DS-1902 hole, which was a 3,412 foot deep exploration hole to drill into the east side of the limb, or the east limb of the anticline. This hole was designed to trace the ridgeline fault as that was a potential feeder identified by the CSAMT and Jim Wright. We designed the hole with a known amount of droop that most of the holes in the area had had, where this hole, of course, behaved in the opposite manner and actually rose slightly. By the end of our 3,400 foot deep exploration hole, we were quite a ways away from our ridgeline fault target by the time we ended the hole. Unfortunately, the once we got out of our known dark star deposit, we stayed out of mineralization. This will help us vector into areas that are hopefully more mineralized and more altered. Putting these all together, now we'll start looking at the North Boolean deposit, which was truly discovered by GSC in 2011. All other previous deposits had had people identified the areas or at least drilling and mapping in the area, whereas GSC was unknown before 2011. This was a blind deposit discovered with the use of gravity, anaconda style mapping, and drilling. Currently, North Boolean shows a proof of concept for an exploration model and future discovery utilizing geophysics. Here we go back to looking at our property and we'll be focusing on the area highlighted by the green box in the north of the property, North Boolean. Within this area, you can see to the right, we have a geologic map. The green is our Mississippian Chainman sandstone, and in pink is our tertiary Indian Wells volcanics. We'll be focusing next on gravity. You can see here in our gravity section, we have a area of high gravity or more dense carbonate rocks within the two faults. We have our North 50 East Fault, which is our west bounding structure, and our, the west strand of our Boolean Fault Zone as our bounding structure on the east, with the Cherry Springs Fault to the south. Next, we'll be looking at a CSAMT section, which is the line drawn across the area, which is now highlighted in green. Here you can see our CSAMT section with a highlighted area indicating a tertiary dacite dike. With this, we have an area of high electrical resistivity indicated by our cooler purple and blue colors, which indicates likely silicification of our carbonate units. Looking at this similar section, we have an interpreted cross section with four drill holes going through it. Our drill holes have identified not only the tertiary dike, but two layers of mineralization. Our higher stratigraphic unit, our gold bearing unit, is held within our Mississippian Tripon Pass. Our lower unit is on the Mississippian Web and Devonian Devil's Gate contact with higher grades being held within the uh, dissolution and collapse breccia, which you can see those higher grades highlighted by the 
red of our drill traces here. Finally, we go back to our gravity, which we also will look at our structural contours of our Devonian Devil's Gate unit. You can see that the gravity high is immediately under our Devonian Devil's Gate, and especially our thickest section of it. And you'll notice to the uh, northwest trending fault zone, which is host to much higher intrusive activity in the area. Exploration moving forward. We have continuous integration of our geophysics with geologic mapping, cross sections, 3D geologic modeling, and geochemistry to define future drill targets. And as our targets are drilled, we reevaluate our geophysical data and our targeting is further defined. So far, we have found this to be a pretty good recipe for success here at GSV. And future data acquisition on new areas of the property will allow for enhanced exploration. One of those such areas is in the 2017 land acquisition with our South Dome as a current uh, project moving forward. So last but not least, the abstract for this presentation was put together with the input of Mac Jackson, who was one of the main drivers in acquisition of the various geophysical data sets in use in the railroad district. This was a Mac project that Mac originally started and I've had the honor to take over. And this is my first presentation since school. So quite exciting and quite nerve wracking. So thank you for the head start on this Mac. Finally, we have our references. All right, thanks Zach. Fantastic presentation. That's <laughs> some incredible data sets. That's, uh, I can imagine that's a lot of fun to work on. Yeah, All right. Thank you. Got it in you for a few questions? Of course. All right. Oh, well, I guess we'll, uh, best way to do this, F feel free to type in questions. I can read them off or uh, looks like we got a few people that are um, raising their hand. I got to try to get my attention any way you can. So Lewis, Winans, I think you're unmuted. So go ahead and talk, Lewis, if you can. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Uh, so centuries ago when uh, I was working with Evolving Gold and we were drilling south of the highway and north of Rain, um, I was using a binoc scope to uh, examine some of the higher grade intercepts that we had. And because I used a light source, it was essentially a track lighting uh, and it generated a lot of heat. Um, the sample I was looking at uh, started to heat up and, uh, and all of a sudden live oil uh, started to come out of the rock. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, uh, the fact that you, you associate a number of these deposits with some of these antiformal structures. And I would ask if any of your drilling has ever encountered any dead and or live oil uh, in the process of uh, exploration. Uh, yes, so especially in our North Boolean deposit, we've noticed large amounts of pyrobitumen, which is the remnants of heated oils. Um, that is about the most that we've found on the property, as mostly what we found is either sulfide or oxide. We found very little uh, oil-rich uh, material in our drilling so far. Good. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, so a couple questions being typed in. We've got from ESI, in the seismic in interpretation of the dark star area, I can see some offsets in the anticline reflections, which could be interpreted as a fault. Um, is there any reason the interpreted fault does not follow this offset? This might've been an earlier question. Uh, likely the reason this is, is because I tried to trace this out on PowerPoint. If we had <laughs> been able to zoom in on some of Jim Wright's data, it would likely follow these structures much better. Cool. All right, question from Richard. Uh, what are the rough costs of the seismic surveys in processing? That I am 
not very familiar with. I've only been with the company a year and a half and none of the data sets have been acquired while I've been with the company. So that would be a question for either Jim Wright or Steve Kaler with GSV. All right, uh, another question uh, relating to recovery. I'm guessing, so what's the recovery to process the sulfide ore? I guess any estimates on uh, recovery out of that? I'm not sure. I'm very focused on the exploration side and have been rather detached from our mine development program, which has been led by Mark LaFoon. But uh, I know we have been looking into an HPGR grind unit to increase our um, recoveries within some of our silica encapsulated ore. Okay. Yeah, I guess the question was related to that, the HPGR. Mm -hmm. so. All right, a uh, question from Ann Fulton. Uh, in terms of the actual resistivity values, uh, what's the absolute difference between decalcified, silicified units and the unaltered rocks? Man, these are some really tough questions. <laughs> these are some hard hitters. <laughs> I've only been out of school for almost four years now, and I unfortunately do not have an answer for you. Sure, no, no worries. Um, uh, uh, Tim Brandon, uh, are 3D seismic surveys employed for these types of deposits, or do you know of any examples? Uh, we do not have 3D seismic surveys. I would not doubt that some of the oil exploration in the area utilizes 3D seismic, but uh, that's a little bit too, too much for us, maybe in cost or maybe just in data sets, and I'm not quite sure about that. This is the, this company's data sets with Seismic are the first that I've dealt with in my career. All right, well, that's the last of the typed in questions. Uh, I don't see anybody else with their hands raised. So with that, Zach, well, thank you for your time. That was a, that was a great presentation. It's yeah, very fun, fun place to work hey. out of imagine, so. Um, Zach? Yes. Oh, hey, this is Dave Reynolds. I did have, there, a Dave. Question, did have a late question for you. I'm a uh, retired seismic processor that's looked at tons of uh, oil 2D, 3D seismic data. And it looks to me like the acquisition parameters for your 2D lines were not particularly effective in the first 400 meters or below two kilometers. Um, could you have Jim uh, or who the other person, Jim Wright or the other guy, uh, get in touch with me and uh, let me know what some of those parameters might have been? Because... Perhaps if you shoot new seismic, you want to adjust your acquisition. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure that both of them are in on this call right now, and they'll hear about it in the morning as well. I'll put so my email thank you for in. Out, Dave. I'll put my email in the comments. Perfect. Thank you very much, sir. All right. All right. Well, no other questions. Thank you all very yes, much. Yes, I have a question for Zerner here. I, oh, yes, sir. I don't have my little hand signal, so I can't do anything <laughs> there. I have to yell, I guess. Um, I did mapping for uh, Chemico there in 1998, uh, I guess it was. It's very interesting that you have the very over steepened, i.e., very steep dips on the east side of Dark Star, because when you go south of that, and my mapping showed really steep dips, basically <laughs> almost cliffs on, on the dip slope. Um, south of that, about uh, well, probably a mile and a half. So okay. Like that, just, just south of where uh, the south fourth of Dixie Creek uh, heads, where the road goes over eventually to, to Jigs in that area. South yes, of that, sir. very steep dips are exposed in the, uh, I think, probably a quartzitic sandstone or quartzite up in that area. So. Yeah, we, we've definitely noticed that. We've got some uh, flat irons in the area extending further to the south. And uh, a couple area, other areas of the property, we have very steep dips as well. One of those areas that we've been mapping is due west of that area in our south dome prospect where we see some overturned stratigraphy as well as vertical stratigraphy. So there's definitely multiple compressional events which are lifting up some of these strata 
and making them vertical and in some cases overturned. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It's kind of vague, but you, you see it and you go, whoa. And then trying to make a cross section is really difficult. So very good work, very interesting. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you. All right, well, thanks a lot, Zach. Uh, sorry, hi, hi Zach. Oh. Yes. Sorry, do you have minutes for? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, just another question for for, for me. Uh, very impressive presentation, Zach. Thanks for sharing the information with everyone. Uh, my question, uh, yeah, my, my question is about the gravity surveys because we have a project uh, in uh, the cutting that area as well. Just wondering, uh, Jim Watt is our contractor to help him with that for the uh, for the imp uh, interpretation of the data. So we are planning to do some gravity survey as well. Just wondering, uh, what is the space between the, like the different gravity lines? I may miss uh, that information. I think it's in somewhere in the presentation. The spacing of our gravity survey yep. points? Yep. Uh, mainly we've done between 200 and 400 meter gravity spacing. Uh, yeah, that's spacing, between, that's spacing between stations or between different lines? Uh, both, sir. They're done on a grid. Uh -huh. So between 200 and 400 meter grid. Yeah. And over our deposits, we try yep. to focus in on a 200 meter grid mm -hmm. and in areas of pure greenfields exploration, such as South Dome, which was done in 2017, I believe, was done on a 400 meter grid. Uh, with yep. continuing exploration, we hope to fill mm -hmm. that in at some point to a 200 meter grid of time and yeah. finances and efforts allow. Yeah. Do you think like the 200 meters spacing of the gravity station, that's enough or that's good enough to interpret some like uh, detailed scale or small scale or secondary like the fold or structures or? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we're missing some of our very fine structures in that gravity data. And we mm -hmm. can definitely infill areas of further interest with more mm -hmm. gravity stations. But mm -hmm. at current scale in the Carlin, we're picking up on a lot of the major structures that seem to be ore controls. And those are really what we're focusing on here. Anything mm -hmm. smaller than that, at least at our deposits, is not too big of a concern as we're gonna pick those up with either our seismic or our field yeah. mapping. And especially with some of our drilling, we've identified some other faults that are mm -hmm. minor ore control structures in their areas. Okay, Anastasia, thank you, thanks. Of course, Jeff, thank you. All right, and with, with that, we'll let you go. Thanks all a lot, right, Zach. sounds good. Thank you all, every, everyone, for your time. This has been pretty fun. All right, have a good night, everybody.